Коллеги, спасибо. Коллеги, спасибо very much, uh, everyone. Good afternoon. We shall now begin the press conference by the Governor of the Central Bank of Russia, Elvira Nabiulina, and we will begin with a statement by Mrs. Nabiulina. Good afternoon. Today, the Bank of Russia Board of Directors decided to keep the key rate at the level of 7.75% per annum. We have every reason to believe that the decisions to raise the key rate made last year are most likely to be sufficient to bring annual inflation back to the near 4% target in the first half of 2020. Some indicators have performed better than we expected in December. Foreign financial and commodity markets have stabilized. The VAT passed through to prices is quite moderate, and inflation expectations have turned to decline. In these circumstances, inflation stands somewhat below our December forecast, while short-term pro-inflationary risks have softened. Given these trends, we expect end 2019 inflation to come in at a lower level of 4.7 to 5.2 percent instead of the 5 to 5.5 percent range forecast earlier. Let me set out further details the factors that were central to our decision. First, as I have mentioned, annual inflation in January and February proved somewhat lower than we expected at the end of last year. In February, it came in at 5.2 percent. Monthly price growth rates have already been going down. Annual inflation will pass its peak in March, April on the back of the base effect. Our updated estimates suggest that at its highest point, inflation may surge to approximately 5.5 percent. You will recall that in December, we did not rule out that inflation might considerably exceed this level. There are several reasons for such inflation dynamics. First of all, the contribution of the VAT hike to annual inflation currently stands at approximately 0.6 to 0.7 percent points, which is close to the lower bound of our expectations. According to our estimates, the VAT passed through to prices has already largely materialized. This is suggested by the analysis of prices of goods and services for which the VAT was raised. These are mostly non-food goods and services. Annual price growth in most of them has accelerated only moderately. In monthly terms, it returned in February to the growth pace seen in September, December last year, seasonally adjusted. However, it still holds somewhat above 4% in annual terms. Weekly inflation estimates suggest similar developments. After a surge in the first two weeks of this year, they have dropped in recent weeks, though holding somewhat above the path that corresponds to our inflation target. Moreover, we do not rule out that the deferred effects of the VAT hike may manifest themselves in the months to come. It is also of note that in February, both monthly core inflation and most other indicators adjusted for volatile components and seasonality exceeded 4% in annual terms. There is evidence that risks that prices of certain food products may grow at an elevated pace have decreased. In February, a decline was registered in prices for a number of products which had made a considerable contribution to acceleration of food inflation. Furthermore, both domestic and external prices of main crops stopped growing in recent months. Current harvest expectations for this year are favorable which also limits risks in this part. Petrol and diesel prices were comparatively stable in December, February, and even drifted downward slightly in February. This constrained inflation acceleration. Furthermore, the ruble appreciated in the opening months of the year. This had a favorable effect on prices and inflation expectations. Inflation expectations and the second factor we closely monitor. We had concerns about their possible response to inflation acceleration. Expectations 
Amongst professional analysts remain anchored. Analysts understand the temporary nature of this year's inflation acceleration associated with one-off factors, in particular the VAT. Therefore, as the Bank of Russia, they forecast a moderate increase in inflation in 2019 and expect inflation to come in at 4% from next year onwards. Households and businesses responded to inflation acceleration more pronouncedly. Expectations of households rose from a historic low of 7.8% seen last April to 10.4% in January. That is returned to their mid-2017 readings. Businesses' price expectations also jumped considerably. However, household inflation expectations dropped to 9.1% as early as March. Price expectations of businesses also declined. However, they both remain elevated. It is of special note that inflation expectation of households and businesses demonstrated last year that they remained unanchored. They follow current changes in prices, primarily petrol and food prices, and ruble exchange rate fluctuations. The third important factor we took into account is consumer demand. Lending underpins consumption, but slowing wage growth constrains a rise in demand. Consumption growth slowed down after a short-term acceleration in November, which was likely associated with preemptive purchases of non-food goods in the run-up to the VAT hike. We can see it from retail sales figures. The rise in consumer activity does not exert pressure on prices. This, amongst other things, is an important reason for a moderate VAT pass-through to prices. The fourth factor is external conditions. A number of changes, which only started to emerge in December, intensified at the beginning of this year. The US Fed and the European Central Bank is their rhetoric as regards the monetary policy outlook. Improvements were seen in markets' expectations regarding the negotiations of international trade restrictions, these factors supported emerging market currencies and reduced their risks premiums. We may say that external risks declined in this part. At the same time, geopolitical risks remain in place. Oil prices in the first quarter were higher than projected in the baseline scenario. However, risks are high that oil production will exceed consumption this year. Finally, overall monetary conditions have changed little, if at all, since the start of the year. Deposit rates have edged higher, while loan rates have stabilized. OFZ yields dipped on the back of improving conditions in global financial markets, as well as a result of reviewed expectations by market participants as to the future key rate path. These OFZ yield movements, while working to constrain the potential of loan and deposit rate growth, are laying the groundwork for their subsequent decrease. With due account for the totality of factors I have mentioned, we have downgraded our inflation forecast for the end of this year to 4.7 to 5.2 percent. At this point in time, it is with a certain degree of confidence that we can say, provided that the situation unfolds according to our baseline scenario, the preventive states we have made so far to increase the key rate last year are most likely to be sufficient to ensure an annual inflation returns to 4% in the first half of 2020. I will now proceed to speak on the risks as usual, despite the reduction in short-term risks. The overall balance of medium-term risks remains tilted towards pro-inflationary ones. As before, we should approach the assessment of external conditions with great caution. The risks related to geopolitical factors remain high. We continue to observe manifold sources of uncertainty in the global economic outlook. Investor sentiment is subject to rapid change in this environment, which is set to impact OFZ yield and the exchange rate. Certainly, elevated and unanchored inflation expectations, as I have said, 
continue to pose a material risk. Moreover, it is premature at this stage to make a precise estimate for the ultimate impact of the VAT increase on prices and inflation expectations. At the present time, producers and retailers are essentially compromising part of their margins to ensure customer retention. The muted demand and competition for market share both work to prevent them quickly passing the tax change on to high prices. This is why they proceed on a piecemeal basis each time they are able to do so. Moreover, there are still stocks built up before the VAT hike. As contracts are renewed, goods taxable at the new rate will come into the market. Taking into account these factors, we do not rule out that the VAT change passed through to prices could be protracted. Having said this, our baseline scenario suggests that the VAT passed through to consumer prices is mostly complete. As regards the main changes to our medium-term forecast, beginning from today, it will be published as part of the key rate press release. You have had the opportunity to read it. The principal change in the forecast is a downward revision of inflation projections for this year. Furthermore, we have refined the average level of oil prices for this year based on their actual movements at the start of the year. The baseline scenario had been revised upwards from $55 to $60 a barrel. The high oil price scenario had been revised downwards from $75 to $70 per barrel. Our oil price forecast for 2020 to 2021 remains unchanged. These adjustments have made no major impact on expected economic growth indicators in the context of the operating fiscal rule. Finalized data suggests GDP growth was 2.3% last year above our expectations. Our estimates suggest that the accomplishment of major investment projects emerged as key enablers of this growth. With due regard for this, we first reconfirm our assessment of the nature of economic growth, the economy is close to its potential, its expansion does not create additional pro-inflationary pressure. Second, we keep our GDP growth estimate in the baseline scenario at 1.2 to 1.7 percent for this year. The growth rates will accelerate to 1.8 to 2.3% in 2020 and to 2.3% in 2021 as the positive effect of national projects and structural reforms provided that these ultimately deliver. The oil price adjustments in the forecast carry implications for balance of payments indicators. In the baseline scenario, the forecast current account balance for this year has been upgraded from 71 billion to 88 billion US, chiefly on the bank on the back of a high value of oil and gas exports. The balance of the financial account of the private sector has also been raised from 20 billion to 35 billion US. This is based on the actual data for the first two months of the year, along with greater opportunities for the buildup of foreign assets given the high export revenues. Over a medium term horizon, balance of payments trends remains unchanged. This year's revision of the estimate of foreign currency reserve from 52 billion to 59 billion US comes as a result of higher foreign currency purchases volumes based on the fiscal rule in the context of higher oil prices. And in conclusion, I would like to make the following comment. Should the situation unfold according to our baseline forecast, we hold open the prospect of a key rate reduction somewhat sooner than we assumed back in December last year. We do not rule out that this may occur in 2019. The Bank of Russia will make its key rate decisions as it always does, taking into account inflation and economic dynamics against the forecast, as well as the risks posed by external conditions and the response thereto by financial markets. Thank you very much for your attention, and I am ready to answer your questions. Dear colleagues, do not forget to introduce yourselves and name your agency. Gulia, please.
Could you please uh, specify the period more specifically, if I understand correctly? We're talking only about the second half of 2019 and uh, that it is probable also as of April. My other question is about the central bank signals on the eve of its board meeting because it was twice that we didn't receive specific uh, information. Um, is it any special tactics or is it uh, comes from the circumstances? And my third uh, contact is about the retromodal. How do you assess the success of such a placement? And is it uh, possible now for the bank and, uh, to uh, make an omission of its obligations in the Chinese yuan, in RMB? As far as the period is concerned, we have indeed specified our expectations linked to the point in time when the conditions may happen in order to reduce our key rate. Previously, we spoke that it w would be the end of 2019 or the beginning of 2020. Currently, we're saying that it will be in 2019. We're not yet ready to share with you any precise data and information as to when exactly this may happen, because it shall depend upon the way the economics and inflation unfold, because there are quite a few uncertainties and risks that I previously referred to. So we will depend upon the way the situation plays itself out this year. As far as signals are concerned on the eve of the Board of Directors meeting, this is our usual practicality not to do so. We did uh, this several times when we deemed it to be necessary to slightly adjust the market expectations when we were able to see that these market expectations are seriously deviating from ours. So in terms of there being any special rule to uh, uh, issue statements before the Board of Directors, we never had it and we're not going to make it uh, this way. But the monetary and fiscal policy issues in between the Bank of Russia Board of Directors uh, involving our experts are being discussed at different uh, venues. So we do share our thinking with the public on these topics because we want to act in a sufficiently transparent way. And as far as uh, Eurobond placement uh, is concerned, yes, indeed, that has been a quite a successful placement. That is the way we see it as well. But in as far as RMB placement is concerned, this is a question more to the Minister of Finance. Elena, please. Elena Fabrichna, Reuters. Uh, could you please uh, say whether the uh, Board of Directors of the Bank of Russia today, amongst possible options, considered the reduction of the cure rate, or is it too early to think about it? And my second question. Is it possible to move over to the neutral rate within 2020, or what are the new time frames for you in this uh, We have reviewed effectively just one option to keep the rate as is at uh, today's Board of Directors meeting. As far as going back to the neutral rate in 2020, we do believe this is uh, possible. Um, let me remind you that based on our estimates, it is uh, 6 to 7 percent. And so we think that it is quite plausible. But again, everything shall depend upon the way the situation unfolds. Uh, colleagues, uh, more questions? Sasha, please. Alexander Sobor, Russia 24. I have a question about the public of Z that the Minister of Finance mentioned. Does the central bank today have any instruments to uh, create the demand amongst the public? The central bank is responsible for the development of the financial market overall. And we are certainly interested in having all of the instruments and all of the institutions at work who enable the financial market players to invest into different options so that the population and the general public may also enjoy the possibility to save and invest not only in the form of the bank's deposit, but also resort to different instrumentality. The main um, concern that we have uh, in terms of what we're trying to currently work uh, on is that we need to propose to the general public the kind of instruments that they are able to comprehend. So we are preparing this law about the qualified and unqualified instruments because quite often people don't understand the complexity of different instruments and the kind of risk that they uh, are invariably accepting. So from this point of view, we are trying to develop this kind of infrastructure, but the peoples of Z, this is also the issue that should be directed to the Minister of Finance. Anastasia, you have uh, 
reviewed upwards your forecast for the oil price uh, and uh, downwards on inflation, but the GDP remains the same. C can it be explained by the fact that you expect that uh, the main um, resources to be dedicated to the national projects uh, won't enter into the economic processes. And my second question, in your response to the bankers uh, previously when you have a meeting with them, you said that if the sanctions strengthen um, and uh, if uh, the OZ is going to be continued to be sold by the non-resident, you will initiate the monitoring of the OZ market. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, would it mean that uh, in case uh, something uh, goes wrong, you're going to buy back the OZ and and issue recommendations and guidelines to the financial market. Yes, indeed, we kept unchanged our uh, forecast uh, for GDP uh, for this year, despite certain oil price um, uh, specification, specificating the oil price expectations more, because the budget rule, the fiscal rule, in many ways makes it possible to turn our economic growth less dependent upon the oil price fluctuations. We also kept this particular forecast based on the following consideration because previously was the case and currently we also expect that in the first half of the year the GDP rate growth might somewhat slow down, which is amongst other things related to the VAT hike. But at the same time, what we act upon and what we hope for is that in the second half of the year the GDP rate growth will uh, pick up related to the fact that the national projects will enter into a faster implementation. But the intraday monitoring, yes, there was another question. Uh, it is true, if uh, the financial stability uh, encounters risks, then along with the regular um, financial monitoring, we will um, initiate uh, more expedient monitoring intraday because within a day period the fluctuations could uh, be characterized by a high volatility and a broader range. Now what comes out of it is that we will apply in a more precise manner the kind of instruments that we have in our possession. We have quite a broad tool set to act um, in the situation of a risk to financial stability. And by the way, um, uh, the fact that we may come out into the OFZ market, this is the kind of an instrument which we have had for quite some time. We didn't use it in 2014 to 2018. And so uh, we do not think that we will resort to it. But we do not rule out that if the circumstances unfold in this way, we always have it uh, to resort to. But we also may apply different instruments like uh, allow our financial institutions in order for them to have sufficient time to adjust to the new uh, environment, not to, to reevaluate the uh, uh, price of uh, the uh, securities. That measure was effective in 2014, and so we believe it to be still quite effective. Tatiana, please. Tatiana Lomskaya, Vedemosti, Elvira Sehipzanovna. The president recently tasked the government and the central bank to reduce the mortgage rate down to 8%. Alongside with that, uh, the long term of the rates um, basically at the level of 8%. So, is there any plan of action that the central bank has in case the long term of the rates do not go down? Our estimates demonstrate that. Upon achieving the 4% uh, level inflation, and if the risk premium go down, the mortgage rates can really um, flow into the 8% range, and even lower. And so our task at the central bank to create the kind of the macroeconomic condition in order for this to be possible. And that is why our monetary policy aimed at bringing inflation back to the 4% level works for the kind of an outcome so that the mortgage rates also diminish. Indeed, with uh, the high inflation, we had uh, a certain rise in the mortgage rate based on what we see since the summer of last year. They grew by about 50 basis points, which is not uh, too much. And whatever we do to curb inflation, we think that, as a minimum, the mortgage rates will stabilize and uh, may go downward further on. Uh, a question from our regional colleagues. Uh, this question comes from Vladimir Chudayev, Media Zavod, agency from Chelyabinsk. May one consider the uh, community services, uh, uh, services affecting the uh, tariffs uh, 
and pushing them upwards, like in the utilization of hard waste, which are also subject to limitation of the monopoly effect. Indeed, the uh, utility services bills and tariffs acted as an important element affecting inflation. And so based on what we estimate this year, the kind of utility tariffs dynamics won't lead to inflation. Yes, indeed, the schedule has somewhat changed because there was one hike in January because of the VAT hike, and the second is planned for July. But that creates a um, better even spread in between the months. So looking at the utility sector in general, we don't note any pro-inflationary fact as the result of the decisions which have been made or which are being made. As far as the hard waste utilization tariffs are concerned, indeed a very strong growth occurred here. What we see is that in February, the annual tariff growth marked itself at 51%. A very big spread in between the regions. In some of the regions, these tariffs went down, and there are other regions where they have grown considerably. In our basket, in terms of the hard waste utilization, these tariffs do account for a sizable share, 0.15 percent. So. I would say that the effect from these tariffs um, was at about 0.7 percent. This is not on inflation. This is not only a social factor. We know that this issue is in the limelight of attention by the federal antitrust authority and different municipality. So we do not expect there being any strong effect from it of inflation. But in between the different different regions, we do see quite a different situation as well. Mitty, please. Very low forecast of the imports. In as far as the midterm outlook is concerned, we are going to publish it once uh, we specify it, and we do specify it by the time we hold the uh, anchor meeting in terms of our scheduling. In terms of additional information and specifying imports, this is explained by specifying the you know, payment balance specification because our adjustments of the oil price expectation is linked to the payment balance and primarily, you know, the slowing down of the import substitution. How do you expect the current situation with the inflation risks? Thank you. We're currently assessing moving over to our target, which is 4% in the first half of 2020. Now, can this happen sooner, effectively, in 2019, following our baseline scenario? No. But undoubtedly, there may be disinflationary factors of a one-off nature, we believe, like the appreciation of the exchange rate and uh, the uh, food prices going down. Any set of drivers which may lead to a disinflationary effect. And we not rule out that this may evolve, but I would like to say that it will hardly affect our rate path because most probably these are going to be short-term natured factors. And about the uh, sanctioner risk. In our baseline scenario, we act on an assumption that the sanctions shall sustain. And we also act on an assumption that the sanctioner risk itself 
whether it will strengthen or not. This is an uncertainty that we are taking into account. Andrei, please. Andrei Briko, Bloomberg. I would like to ask you to comment uh, also on uh, the uh, uh, payment balance because uh, in the uh, public governance sector, you know, it is expected to be uh, the total, which is 6.1 billion. So, do you expect this uh, to flow into the OFZ? I mean, what is the reason uh, against the backdrop of you saying that geopolitical risks remain? And the second uh, um, uh, question: the money market uh, are, are planning for two rates uh, reductions starting from the third quarter. I'm sorry. Well, um, let me just deal w w with uh, the rate question. Uh, I would simply repeat the formula that there is that we allow for the possibility for the rate to go down in 2019 without specifying when exactly this may happen. This is our basic uh, expectation as long as the situation develops according to our baseline scenario. Now, in as far as the financial account uh, for the public governance and the central bank uh, are concerned, this is indeed related to the fact that uh, we think that about 2 billion U.S. will enter into the OZ market from non-residents. That is our expectation. And 4 billion uh, U.S. dollars, uh, euro bonds, which have already taken place. Genia, please. Thank you. Evgenia Pismina, Bloomberg. The investment environment in Russia has worsened. Well, this is quite evidently demonstrated by the Calvi case. And Central Bank has also reconsidered in its outlook uh, the expectations for the capital outflow and reduced its uh, estimate uh, for the investment growth. Now, my question, you have raised the outflow expectations and reduced investments inflow. Is it related also to the worsening of the investment environment and to the Calvert case? No, this is uh, unrelated to these things at all. The uh, revaluation of our investment environment, uh, as far as the capital outflow is concerned, I mentioned it on more than one occasion. To us, the mirror-like kind of a reflection is, uh, you know, uh, the current account growing because we raised our estimate on the old price forecast. That in itself reflects in raising our estimate in terms of the current account surplus, and that reflected in the capital outflow, which is not related to the outflow of the capital from Russia. That may theoretically be related to the uh, reduction of the financial obligations or the financial assets because uh, during the first two months we see that uh, the financial assets are growing of our companies and banks. So that is indeed a reflection of the way the uh, current account uh, behaved itself uh, uh, and us changing our oil price expectations because where the you know current account surplus goes it goes either into the private sector operations of the public sector or the accumulation of the currency reserves we have reconsidered and revised the, the um, currency reserves because the oil price changed. And we also take into account the results of the first two months, which have already manifested themselves. And the same applies to the investment assessment. Thank you. And uh, with your permission, I would uh, announce another question from our colleagues from uh, uh, Russian region. Yana Maltsova, VL Internet Portal from Vladivostok. The key rate was raised in December, September last year. Has the mega regulator calculated to the extent to which the interest rates changed in uh, the commercial loans by the bank? To what extent uh, the higher uh, key rate may affect the uh, consumer lending and reducing the uh, consumer uh, debt leverage? Well, yes, indeed, in the second half of last year, there occurred a certain hike of uh, the loan and deposit rates, and actually not as the result of the central bank raising its key rate, but because the inflation was growing. And we were able to witness it that even before we raised our key rate in September, 
the bank rates, some of them, started growing as a response to the high inflation, to the higher of the yield. And we can see that the loan and deposit rates also reacted, but very moderately. I mentioned with regard to the mortgage, 50% uh, uh, basis point growth, uh, which started happening sometime since summer. But in as far as the consumer lending is concerned, that was about 60 basis points. And in as far as the corporate lending, long-term corporate lending, that was about 70 basis points. By the way, in as far as the deposits were concerned, this was a high growth, 130 basis points, which in many ways enabled one to maintain um, the uh, you know, deposit uh, for the household more attractive and uh, undoubtedly in order for the lending rates to go down we need the inflation to go down to stabilize and uh, to um, uh, hold within our target point. As far as consumer lending is concerned it has been growing at quite a high pace and we have been undertaking and we are undertaking a certain special set of measures in order to reduce uh, the lending uh, pace by high percentage uh, rates in order to uh, curb uh, the uh, household leverage going high. And so some of the measures will come into effect as of April 1st. Yes, please. Yes, we have a colleague from the Journal First. Sometime a month ago, in the Information Security Department of the Central Bank, they said that they are working on the anti-fraud measures uh, for, for, against fraudsters who are uh, using the telephone call fraud when they uh, pretend that they're calling from the bank's uh, customer and the customers disclose all the information. Because they do it voluntarily, there were difficulties with uh, compensating for such a loss. Has the Central Bank come up with some sort of a resolution to this? Well, of course, this is not a question about the monetary policy, but I do grant you this is an important thing, an important question, because this is one of an important task that we are facing to try and reduce the probability of uh, fraud taking place, particularly with uh, the expansion of uh, these new technologies, uh, mobile and digital solutions. So we are. Uh, looking into this uh, with uh, the banks themselves, because these are the banks themselves who will need to pay attention at what kind of additional mechanisms should be initiated in order to avoid this. But uh, we'll speak about the specific things next time, if you don't object. Uh, colleagues, please. Gulia. I have an additional question. What does the Central Bank uh, ex uh, explain the appreciation of the ruble with, since, uh, which has happened, has happened since February? And uh, how does it affect inflation? Well, firstly, we believe that uh, the exchange rate effect over inflation as it was, it remains about 0.1%, less than it used to be several years ago, particularly since we have this asymmetric uh, effect ratio when ruble depreciate that affects inflation stronger uh, as opposed to ruble appreciating. The appreciation of the ruble by itself took place because of the external markets. There was a revaluation of uh, the monetary policy path by the mature economies and the risk in premium between the countries with the emerging markets uh, somewhat subsided, which led to a stronger attraction um, of the emerging economies in the minds of investors. And this is something that we also felt. And so this softening effect, uh, I mean, in the rhetoric uh, by the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank. Yes, colleagues, go ahead. Anastasia. I would like to ask, uh, have the VEB agreed uh, with the central bank about the 12 billion uh, rubles uh, debt that has been made available to uh, take uh, Globex Bank out of uh, bankruptcy because uh, they said that we don't need this compensation and somehow deal the problem with this uh, bank? Well, we are negotiating. We haven't yet finished them. But these negotiations are underway. Andre, please. 
Andrei Ostrov, Reuters. I would like to ask you to specify uh, the situation with the ruble. You have revisited uh, the oil price uh, forecast, but at the same time you are saying that the ruble appreciation is somewhat uh, restricted inflation. Can one say that the current uh, ruble exchange rate is being defined more by the uh, investments or by a non-resident into the OZ rather than by oil prices? Well, uh, you see, uh, ruble, since the beginning of the year, uh, appreciated by about 9%, uh, maybe a little bit less than that. And so on an expert level, we do believe that about 2-3% of the, this 9% is the oil price effect, while the remainder is, you know, the capital account movements and flow, including the interests of non-residents towards OFZ and some other factors. But this is indeed the oil price effect uh, being weaker than the capital account flow. Yes, Masha, please. Maria Stepanova, TAS Information Agency. Elvira Sapizanova, we're currently here, a very active discussion of reducing the fee for acquiring. And there is also a proposal that we're hearing to uh, completely um, uh, take away the uh, fee that the acquiring banks charge. So what do you think about it? But again, this is not on the subject matter, dear colleagues. Um, it is true. Well, first of all, our position is that there shouldn't be any administrative regulation by the government of the commercial tariffs charged by commercial operators. We believe that these should be regulated by the market at least on the basis of achieving an agreement between the banks, between the payment systems, and respectively the retail market players. Such agreements, such negotiations are currently taking place. There are some agreements that have already been reached, and the central bank does uh, act as the moderator of uh, these discussions. These agreements apply to a number of goods and services. In the meantime, uh, the retail chain representatives believe this not to be sufficient, but we have agreed that we should negotiate further. It is important for us to maintain a certain balance here. First of all, we ascertain that the a reduction of such tariffs may rather end up uh, in the redistribution of revenue between the banks and the retailers and would not uh, provide any good uh, to the end users, to the consumers, uh, in terms of making the goods and services more affordable. This is something that we don't see yet. And secondly, we must not avoid destimulating the bank while they're being developing the whole infrastructure related to the cashless settlements because over the past few years, there has been a very serious growth registered in cashless payments. And I believe that everybody would be better off from this economy becoming less cashless. And this is the kind of trend that is very important to sustain and strengthen so that the banks are well incentivized to develop the cashless settlement sector. Therefore, the question whether one should eliminate something or, or bring down to 0% and what kind of tariffs or fees, what kind of them should be, this is the subject of negotiation between the retailers and the banks and the central bank, uh, we believe, should uh, refrain from uh, regulating it. Yes, colleagues uh, from TV. Uh, good afternoon, Artur Podilski, um, Izvestia channel. Uh, several days ago on the Central Bank website there was information published about which sectors of economy that have a um, uh, lot of dubious operations, uh, construction, uh, services sector and uh, real uh, manufacturing sector turned out to be in the lead. Well, I suppose this is the, the, we were now finished with the questions about the monetary policy. But nevertheless, yes, it is another important aspect of uh, the Central Bank's uh, uh, policy as such. We are undertaking measures in order to reduce the existence of the dubious financial sources, the ones which service the shadow economy and the shadow uh, sources of revenue. And we do regular analysis in terms of which are the industries and sectors 
where one may find the concentration of such revenues in order to pay attention to them and draw the attention of the banks to them because we work through the financial institutions in order to have the financial institutions to monitor such sectors and uh, based on the risk-oriented approach because we see where such risks are existent in which kind of industries and respectively we work with the financial industry in order to restrict the circulation through an economy of illegal proceeds and the financial flows with a dubious origin. Well, dear colleagues, I believe that our time is coming to an end, but there is another person who hasn't just read the question. Anna, please, go ahead. Anna Kolegina, is this your newspaper? Uh, one of these days, uh, we had a guest speaker, Mr. Titov, who is our business ombudsman, and uh, he was quite uh, vocal about uh, uh, there being quite a high rate because inflation is uh, uh, 5.7 and, and uh, the key rate is 7.75 and the businesses really find it hard because the profitability is a historically low level, 6%, and so the businesses believe that this lag between inflation and the key rate is too uh, big. So would you be able to comment and somehow respond to, to the representatives of the business community? Thank you very much. It is true that many corporates uh, complain that the uh, lending is not available to them, but overall we see that the lending activity in the economy is growing because the rates of growth of lending activities are overall not too bad and they are ahead of the GDP growth. What's important is the structure of such lending. And that is why we are introducing incentivizing regulation. That's what we intend to do in development. In as far as uh, very high rates are concerned, the level of rights, I should say, yes, indeed, uh, one often links it to the key rate, but uh, I would rather draw attention to the more fundamental linkage between the e in the economy with inflation rather than the key rate. Just remember, several years ago, the key rate was a low one, while the uh, uh, Bank rates were mm, higher. But why? Because there was a higher inflation. And the economic players respond to inflation in the first place. And when certainly the inflation rate is what the central bank targets, but artificial reduction of the key rate won't lead to the economic rates going down. Everybody should be aware of it because the main path to it uh, in order to make lending available is to reduce inflation. A stable lower inflation would enable lending activity as well as enable long-term lending which is necessary to activize the economy. And we can monitor this within the mortgage loans because these are long-term loans and these have become more affordable and available to the households specifically against the inflation going down. Yes, indeed, many compare the rates with profitability. I mean, projects can be different, and by the way, the profitability is something that the companies should uh, uh, improve because our productivity of labor is not very high, which in itself in many ways is related to uh, a very low profitability. And so the restructuring of manufacturing processes, which, which ultimately lead to a greater competitiveness and greater efficiency and a higher profitability, I would say is a very important component in this particular equation, you know, rates and profitability, uh, if you will. So once again, our policy coincides with the wishes of the businesses to make uh, you know, rates more affordable, but we believe this is only feasible by reducing inflation and a respective you know, fiscal policy which up outwardly leads to lower inflation. Well, dear colleagues, thank you very much for your questions.